are. Yeah. Welcome. Hmm? Yes, we're there. Okay. We are there. We are here. Who are we, right Aaron? Here. Big pardon? Who are we, Aaron? Well, anyone looking at the screen can see that you are Peggy Mason, but the screen you. does not. I'm and Aaron. you are Aaron Freeman. But the screen does not say that you are a tenured professor of neurobiology at the University of Chicago, aside from being an internationally traveled and famous and begged for speaker, lecturer, teacher, and general guru. Let's calm <laughs> down now a little bit. Okay, I just wanted to, <laughs> wanted to make sure that those things that were not said on the screen were at least said aloud so that the audience might know how magnificent you are. Thank you, Aaron. So, so today I, I would like to, first of all, express my great condolences to you and to the whole Brackett family. I understand that Elizabeth Brackett was your good, very good friend, and I'd like to hear more about who she was and, and how you knew her. Well, first of all, you know you met her. You, you remember meeting her, right? We Oh, I thought you, okay. She You met her at the, there was an art show that we went to that had where there was a, a million dollar glass structure. Do you remember that? It was on a Navy Pier, I think, or some big fancy hotel. Well, I remember we we've been to a few art shows together. Yeah, but there was one particular one. Okay. okay. Oh, show. I remember that one. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, and so you met her there, but then it right. wasn't like we hung out or anything. Oh, okay. But you would have really, really. It was uh, at Sofa. Really it was at Sofa. Sofa. That's exactly right. Sofa. It was at Sofa. Art. Absolutely. Right. Sofa. Navy she was a very was art great kind of woman. And it's a really, well, she's, you know, she and I worked together forever. She and I did a, a science show together. We did a show called Chicago Tomorrow on uh, Channel 11. And she, we, we met on a dance floor, which I have done videos on. But she, you know, she and I really bonded over rocket science because she was covering uh, the Challenger disaster for the news hour. And so when they were during that whole process of trying to figure out what the heck was going on and what was doing it, uh, that was uh, she. She and I were in very close contact and bonded in our love for trying to figure out what the heck happened. And oh, you know, I, I just have to add that I was a graduate student at the time, and I I was doing experiments. So I had a radio going as I'm doing experiments. As ah. I'm prepping them anyway, and the radio. All day, every day, I listened to the Challenger hearings. Oh, yeah. I well, found so it the most fascinating thing. I love when um, science gets some publicity, when, it, <laughs> when it's on the radio. So it that's was true. great. So what an interesting thing, one of the interesting things about Elizabeth and her accident, which happened so at this point, it happened like Wednesday morning was her accident. And of at this week. point. Wednesday of last week. Yeah, Wednesday of last week, yes. And at this point last week, last Thursday, was just when we heard that she had been without oxygen or she had, she had been without a heartbeat for at least nine minutes. So there are two things I'm curious about this. So she she broke her second cervical vertebra. She had a fracture in the second vertical uh, cerv cervical vertebra. And one one theory, no one actually knows because no one saw her. There were no witnesses. And, you know, we just found someone, a, a good Samaritan, started doing CPR, which apparently was not strong enough to register on her pulse, or her Fitbit for her pulse. Uh, but the theory is, one theory is, that when she had that break in that yeah. vertebra, that, that she also had a, 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 a like sort of a trauma, uh, an, uh, an insult to her spinal cord. Spinal cord. Right. And one yeah. theory is that what, that's... Can we pause one moment? Yes. Somebody is saying that they can't hear us. Oh, they can't hear us. Oh, um, wow. Uh, Lawani, can, Lawani, can you hear us? So Marge, is it, is it Marjan only? Yeah, Marjan, Marjan, Marjan can't hear us. Donna, can you hear us? Emma, can you hear us? Emma? Hello, hello? Let's see, is there anyone who can hear us? You can hear me. Okay, can hear uh, John you. can hear. John, okay, great. Okay, uh, let's assume. If, well, if sorry, Marjan. Can hear us. Okay. So can can hear us. Okay. 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 Sorry, so anyway. Marjan. I hope I hope it resolves. Yes. Oh, okay, Tammy, we love Tammy. Tammy's wonderful. Tammy is Tammy. Tammy is a Valkyrie. Tammy is a Valkyrie. A big, My mother was one of the Minnesota Jews up there from the My land. My mother was of, a Valkyrie. Say what? 
My mother was a Valkyrie. Oh, really? He belonged to a, sor a, a, a sorority that they named Valkyries. Ah, cool. Yeah. So, okay, let's go back to, to Elizabeth. Yes. Yes. So what happens? Oh, Lonnie <laughs> missed you last week. There was two weeks of, of pain and misery without Peggy. <laughs> so, um, so if you a, a bang on the on the spinal cord. So the real problem with with a high cervical injury, and one person who had that was Christopher Reeve. Yes. Okay. So a high cervical injury. It turns out that you breathe because of uh, neurons in your spinal cord, okay? But you, but they're stupid neurons. They don't know what to do. They need a input from an input from the the hindbrain. So there are neurons in the medulla called the prebotzinger complex that tell the the phrenic motor neurons that inter, that innervate the diaphragm what to do they say contract i was going to say that andine's curse what's that andine's curse. curse is is related but um that's a that's a, a condition Andean's where andine's curse is a problem to. with responding to to co2 buildup and you have to consciously breathe you have to think about it yeah but if you consciously breathe with a with a lesion or an injury at the high cervical levels, you can consciously wish to do it as much as you want, and it, the message is not getting through. So my suspicion is that she at least lost um, breathing for enough time that her heart said, "You know, I'm not that happy. I'm gonna either I'm gonna slow down or." Or quit. She probably it probably didn't slow down. It's probably as you said, it just didn't pump strongly enough to to be recorded by the um, the the contraption that she was wearing. Which so, you should explain why why you know so much about. Oh yes, yeah. The reason we know so much about it is that my buddy Elizabeth Brackett, six time world champion triathlete in her age group was training for her seventh uh, world championship competition this September in Australia. And she was rigged up. She had her heart rate monitor. She had her uh, uh, pulse monitor and all the data of her ride that day, the complete 31 minutes of it was being beamed by her phone to her trainer. So we know exactly where she was, what kind of, wiggling paths she took before she fell over we know at what point her heart stopped and when it started up and we're pretty certain that the cpr she got was insufficient to certainly to register as pulse on her equipment until until, until they did until right until the uh, professional got there. So, so nine minutes is a really long time for the brain to be without oxygen. In general, the brain is going to complain starting within a couple, and and certainly within three minutes, it's really going to complain. Complain? What do you mean complain? <laughs> Those neurons are going to be, <laughs> where's my oxygen? And they're going to start to die. They're going to start to get really non-functional and eventually die and they'll uh they, once they die they don't come you know they're not coming back um so can, is there any do the outer cortical layers die first or do does the medulla die first or is there any known course of cell death within the context of oxygen dex or anoxia well, the, the, the cells that are the most sensitive to anoxia or hypoxia anoxia is no oxygen right. hypoxia is a lowering of oxygen so the ones that are the most sensitive to losing uh oxygen are the ones in the hippocampus oh okay which is why so many people have these you know, after they have a heart attack, they've only lost oxygen for maybe a minute or a minute and a half because some they've had a very brief insult 
um, and uh, or they've been in a hypoxic situation. So, for example, just having sleep apnea, it lowers the amount of oxygen your brain is getting. Huh. So okay. These kinds of um, of insults can the first cells that are going to be sick and possibly die from it are the ones in the hippocampus. After oh, the hippocampus, I'm not sure what the order is, <laughs> but I think that, I mean, in, in after three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, it doesn't matter. It's going to be the brain. It's going to be the neurons in the brain. So I but assume there is just quit. Well, I assume that I, I think I read this because I was very interested in this. Of course, that 15 minutes is pretty much the outer limit before you just flat out brain dead. 15 minutes without oxygen is. So, I mean, 15 minutes sounds really, really long. <laughs> okay. So nine minutes is nine really minutes. long. Like, I, I mean, it depends. Again, it, it does depend on whether you're anoxic or hypoxic. So no oxygen for five minutes, I do not think that the brain is going to survive that. But a low level of oxygen for some, then it depends on how much oxygen. It, but in well, any case, she was way too long without oxygen, without enough oxygen. Now, is it possible that she could have had oxygen in her brain without a pulse or a heartbeat? There's just extra blood up there? The, is that the, the, the order of sensitivity to oxygen is brain, breathing, heart. Okay. So the heart will keep on breathing. Right. will keep on, I'm sorry, it will keep on beating. Yes. That'll keep on beating outside of your body. It will keep on breathing outside of your body. It will keep on breathing for a long time without, when you're not breathing and you're not bringing in any oxygen, long after the brain right. has has died. Right. But now you make, you make an interesting point. Cause I, I, th that you could have very low levels of brain activity and not be brain dead. Even though your brain is in a state where all the docs say the probability of survival is minimal. So the way that we, we judge brain death in the United States, and I don't know how other countries do it, but in the United States, the whole brain has to be not working. So what does that mean? First of all, what's the brain? The brain is anything that's inside the cranium. So it includes the brain stem and the forebrain. It okay. does not include the spinal cord. Okay. So the brain has to be not working and... It can't in, have. But EEG would show zero activity. You, and how do we judge activity? We judge it by these really fundamental reflexes that are present in the brainstem. Uh, so one is remember, you turn your head and you turn your eyes in the opposite direction. If I'm looking at my finger, my eyes turn in the opposite direction from where my head turns. That's right. called the vestibular ocular reflex. If you have that, you are not brain dead. But and the you know the real the one that sort of is always the the linchpin here is uh, is breathing because you have a reflex to breathe. You yes. have it, it. It's not exactly a reflex, but it's an automatic movement. And as CO2 builds up, you're supposed to breathe. Okay. Good idea. If you're Excellent not breathing, idea. <laughs> it suggests that your brainstem is not working. So what if people not do. Breathing, it, but okay, but your brainstem, but this was an injury that was below the brainstem. This was the, the C2. So why should that affect breathing then? Be, so the, the injury is below, but the, but. The injury is a part of the pathway. But, but no, but the, now you're without oxygen. It's not about the injury. It's about the loss of oxygen. And the loss of oxygen is now having an effect on, oh, on the, the brain. Function of the lung. It's killing the brain because those neurons need their oxygen. 
So is it killing the hippocampus? Well, yeah, the hippocampus is probably long gone by three, four, five minutes, but maybe some of those brainstem neurons survived. But if the, if Elizabeth didn't start to breathe again, then they were not alive. She had mm -hmm. apnea, apnea, A-P-N-E-A, -E didn't breathe. So there is, as you could imagine, at this point last week, yeah, we were all thinking there's got to be some new experimental weird thing that the Russians are doing or that the Europeans have done, or there must be some theory about. Well, I remember you you texted me and you, you are, asked. Me, okay, I'm just saying yes. <laughs> and and I I just before I answer that, I just want to say to Luani. If, if the brain is dead, can the spinal cord have activity? And absolutely, the spinal cord could have activity. And the spinal cord would have activity. And that person would still be brain dead. What? Where would the commands traveling down the spinal cord come from? Well, not all the things that the spinal cord does are commands. Some of them are internal to the spinal cord, such as reflexes. Ah. So, for example, the knee-jerk reflex that when somebody taps your knee and your your foot you kick out you kick jerks out you kick that them. that can happen without your brain okay okay um but you're going to tell me about the russians who could have so, saved my friend <laughs> so i think the most exciting work in in all of this um people who have lost consciousness or or uh, let me put it this way people who have lost consciousness in the way that you and I have consciousness. Okay? They've lost typical consciousness. Um, bringing those people back from their never, never land. One of the people who's doing the most exciting work is, is somebody named Nicholas Schiff, who happens to be um, the son of my mother's maid of honor. And she was my, she was my mother's maid of honor and my mother was her maid of honor. Anyway, they're very, very good friends. And, and we grew up a lot together. And I'm just really, really proud of, of what Nico has done, um, which has been to, to look at, um, is there any, are there any of these individuals who have problems with their consciousness that we can bring back? And what he has found out is that, yes, there are. And the the group of people that can be brought back are people with what's called a minimally conscious state. This is, you have coma where people are unresponsive, unresponsive, unresponsive. Then you have this persistent vegetative state where, for example, they can breathe. And then you have something called minimal conscious state. And that is something that has only been brought to the fore in the last a dozen years or so. And in the minimally conscious state, you can be brought back to a functional or, or a, well, I'm not, not a fully functional perhaps, but a functioning state where you can communicate and you can, uh, it, it can be revealed that you actually have, there's somebody inside. You know, it's right? funny. I, I, I had just learned one of the other things I learned this week I thought the persistent vegetative state was the worst kind of brain state, but it turns out that my buddy who was in a coma, and a coma is worse. You coma. want, you'd rather be in a persistent vegetative state than in a, a deep coma. Neither of them is great. Well, okay. <laughs> Not that, so one of the things that Nico has done is to look at who gets into the persistent, I'm sorry, who gets into the minimally conscious state? What type of patients actually shift into this from you know, they usually start in a coma and they get better and better. Right. I mean that I, I, anyway, they get, people get better. Um, and so who's going to get into a minimally conscious state. And then when Nico has a, a variety of tricks that he can use, one of them being a, electrical stimulation um, that he can use to essentially wake these individuals up. And who amongst the whole minimally conscious state population is the most likely to respond? 
And the answer is that the ones that are the least likely to respond are those that have had a hypo a, a loss of oxygen. That's the most final of the insults that can happen to the brain. People so, that have a traumatic a, a stroke or um, a, or trauma, but they don't lose oxygen, they are the most likely to first of all recover and second of all recover more, particularly in, in and also with these interventions. Now, my little buddy, my good buddy Mike, says that he has lost consciousness as a result of coughing. Huh? How do you lose consciousness as a result of coughing? I really don't know. Huh. But, but so wait, what did he say here? Uh, that the uh, I may hold. People tell him to hold out his arm. Tell me, he may hold out his arms and recover in a few minutes. Huh. That's a new yeah. one. And, and Maggie is bringing up that there's great work on minimally conscious state at the University of Western Ontario. And, and it's true. There's, there's a lot of people. It's not just Nico that are working on this. Um, yeah, it's, it, uh, and there's well, a think great you... book. I want to, I want to totally recommend anyone interested in the minimally conscious state should read, uh, rights come to mind, which is by Joseph Finns, F I N S fabulous book. Huh. I have a blog on it. Um, a, one post on it. You mean your uh, fabulous blog, the brain is so cool.com that everybody should really check out the, the, the brain fabulous is blog that I almost never write in. Ah, what? There's a bunch of stuff that you've written in the past. There may yeah. not be the absolute today's news, but br the brain is so cool.com. Peggy yes. Blog. Yeah. So I think what I hear you saying is that they're really, which is what you said last week, that for someone who's had nine minutes of hypoxia, let's just say nine minutes of that, there really wasn't anything and we didn't miss anything that there wasn't that we, we can kick us up. Oh, if only I had asked someone else. No, <laughs> not going for this. So you, you, I mean, I think that that's hard for some people to take. And then, you know, you're, you're sort of, I, I'm, I'm curious how that, when I told you and I was honest yes. with you, Yes. How, how was that for you? Well, so what happened was that, the, in, as I said, a week ago today, everybody was calling everybody they knew. They said, the, uh, her, her relatives were saying to me, we need to find a brilliant neurologist. And I said, well, I have a brilliant neurologist over at uh, Rush, my neurologist, uh, Dr. Wonderful Adriana Bermeo, wonderful neurologist. And I said, well, I do have a friend who's a, 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 a professor of neurobiology in Chicago. We're just calling it everybody. So we, and then we all said, okay, who'd you find? What'd you find out? And basically, everybody they talked to said that it's – don't buy any green bananas. <laughs> no. Yeah. So, you know, you could, you, but the, th the fact is that probably you could have supported her um, with cardiac life. Yes. Right. I mean, and, and, and that, but her brain would have not been working. Right. Well, she, again, she never gained. And was that, was that ever to... something that was attractive to you? Oh well, that was not, not even obviously issue. not your choice. No, but. yeah, but it, there was no question. Elizabeth was a badass. She was an athlete, a triathlete. She was a diver. She was the first uh, woman on the to get a, with a to get a, on the varsity diving team at the University of Indiana. She was totally a physical being. I met her on the dance floor as the jock dancer that she is. So there was never a question that she would be sustained because the options they said, well, you know, you can we can keep her on the breathing, and we can give her a feeding tube and take her to a nursing home and she can live. But no, but there that's was no not, question. That's not her life. No, not even for a split second. There was never even considered. It was offered. The doctor said, okay, well, here are your options. But the yeah. option of being, who would? I don't think there's anybody. Well, there's plenty of people that would. Yeah, I, I can't imagine anyone would want a lot. We, no, no, I can't there's, plenty, there's plenty of people that keep, 
Yeah, I mean, one thing is that she had a long, wonderful life. Yes, it, yes. The so one way to look at, at what happened with Elizabeth was that she had a long, wonderful life. She went out with her boots on. Absolutely. But now Sharon asked a question, which I was not smart enough to. So what does it mean to support her with cardiac life? It means that um, that you would be breathing for her. And you would be, you know, you probably put in a pacemaker or something. So to make sure that her, her heart didn't stop and you would persist with keeping that heart beating, even, um, as the brain is dead and it, and it, you know, this has happened before. It has often happened with younger people, people who are in their teens or, or, or children or in their twenties or possibly thirties where it's really very difficult for the families to understand um, what has just imploded, you know, exploded upon their lives. And you're, you know a fair amount about neurobiology and it was still a confusing time for you. Well, so yeah. imagine a person who has no grounding in neurobiology, no context, no framework in which to think about this. And all of a sudden they're being asked, well, do you want to keep your loved one alive or not? It is an unbelievably difficult position for a person to, to go into with really no knowledge. And, sure. and one of the, one of the people who, who conveys the, the amount of confusion and distress and, just sort of the ridiculousness of this decision making in that context is Joseph Finn's in this rights come to mind. Hmm. Um, well, let me it's, say, it's a really that, good description of that. Well, you're we saying, that, of course, that very few people that we can imagine would want to be kept alive, just have what is it, cardiac support. But there is one circumstance wherein I would want to be kept alive. Uh, with breathing and cardiac support, which is that if having an Aaron doll for some period of time would be comforting and help my the great love of my life, Sharon, get used to the idea. Because, you know, it, the, the, the accident happened on Wednesday and she, she didn't actually officially die till Sunday. And that period of time gave the relatives time to come in and, and everybody got a chance to, as you say, it's, it's hard with someone young and, you, and it was hard with her because nobody expected this, not even for a split second. She went out for her normal training ride. So, it's right. already, so but I say this, so I ask you, my dear friend, if, uh, would you, are you into with this? If somebody, if, if keeping you artificially just existing would help your spouse get through the process of accepting your death. I I just don't I don't I don't see me as alive once I've once well, I've lost my you're brain. You're dead. There's no question. You're dead. Yeah. But would you say that? Well, Giselle, you can keep me around as long as it helps you. You want to? I don't think Giselle would want a little Peggy doll. <laughs> I, I mean, I. I no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it, and I wouldn't want it from her, and I wouldn't want it for me. But um, you just now didn't you just say that, that people do that when they're when the deaths are are of people who are young and they're oh, unexpected. Oh, I, I have total compassion for individuals who make that choice. I would not make that choice. So, so I I, I just want to read a few of these comments, which yes. are really great. So yes. Donna says. Living with a formerly brilliant person after severe TBI, I'm relieved and grateful that Elizabeth wasn't subjected to what she wouldn't consider life. And I think that's very apt. And um, and then Tammy says, the question is, what is living? Right? Uh, so these are these are very, you know, these are all apt questions. And, well, you and talked the, about the reality is that what is living is not, I can say that for myself, but I cannot say that for you. So I want to, I would just want to, we have to close up, but yeah. I want to put a plug in for a book called Defining Death, which is by Robert Vetch and uh, Lainey Ross. And this book dis to discusses the two definitions of death and how, uh, how much they come into conflict so often in our world. And 
what she proposes, I'm pretty sure will ne- won't happen in the near future, but I think it, it would be great, which is to say, everyone gets to choose from three options. One is that you're dead when your your heart stops beating. One is that you're dead when your brain stops functioning. And the third is that you're dead when your forebrain stops functioning. So personally, I would go with the forebrain. If oh, wow. I have a brain if I have a brain stem that's keeping me breathing and and keeping my blood pressure up and doing all that, but I couldn't add two plus two, I don't want that life. Um, so, so their recommendation is that those are the three choices. People get to choose from one of them, but they can't, you know, they can't hedge their bets and choose two. <laughs> you can't be cardiac alive and brain alive. Okay. You've got to choose one definition and go with it. Well, so I guess the- it's a really interesting book. And, and what I, I think that in the end, it's a really non- it's not an easy issue, um, and, and you know it's tough, and and it's worthwhile to think about because you know hopefully it won't happen in your future, but it could. It happened to you. You know you yeah, just yeah, encountered yeah, this like, last well, week. Well, of course, you know I'd like to say this, but of course nobody beats death. death. But my, my good buddy, buddy Elizabeth beat the daylights out of aging. She is 76 years old, 76, and never got old. Never, I knew the woman for 35 years. She was as vibrant and as fabulous and inquisitive and passionate training for a triathlon as she was when I first met her on a dance floor 35 years ago. So that's is, wonderful. And on that you, note, on that note, Elizabeth, Peggy Mason, professor of neurobiology, beat aging. There you go, beat aging. A major Elizabeth. We're the Brain Buddies, and we will see you hopefully next week. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks all you guys for watching. Thanks for your brilliant questions. Yeah, really great questions and comments. Great. Thank you, guys, and we'll see you very soon next week. Next week. Next week. And I'm the Brain Buddies.